you cannot expect to um, do this by yourself or, or get an amazing project by yourself. doesn't matter who you are or what you are. This space always requires capital because, because you need to build that tech. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Matthew Ung. If you don't know who Matthew is, he's a serial entrepreneur and founder of Warp, spelled W-A-R-R-P. It's a software company that helps people develop NFT projects. He's also the founder of the Toast Punk NFT project. How you doing, Matt? I'm great, man. How are you, Michael? Awesome. Welcome to the show. I'm super excited to have you today. And today, Matt and I are going to explore important considerations before starting an NFT project. Now, before we go there, I would love to hear your backstory because obviously you're a lot more than just an NFT guy. So start wherever you want to start and then bring us up to ultimately how you got into NFTs and maybe more about what Warp is doing. I would love to hear that story. Absolutely, Michael. No worries, man. I'm glad, glad to share. So, um, yeah, by, um, uh, for the last 20 years, actually, I've been um, uh, involved in various kind of startups um, and, and businesses, helping them essentially set themselves up uh, for scale and then exit. Uh, I've done it three times in the past. The first one I actually did was um, when I was 20 years old um, by myself, um, and I sold my company to Google in about a year. Wow. Um, and and from that there, it uh, catapulted into different sort of things, um, all sorts of di different industry verticals from manufacturing to energy uh, to automobile, et cetera. Um, so I got my hands in pretty much a lot of things. Um, what I found was um, an application of understanding what a business can solve and do is, is more critical than anything else. And, and that's what I did. But my passion always lies, you know, from the very get go in technology and um, what technology can do uh, in the future for many, many various things. And, and we know the world is heading in that sort of direction with not just, um, you know, crypto and, and blockchain, but various other automations and artificial intelligence and metaverse and all that sort of other things. So anyhow, um, I, I, I built up, as I said, and sold three companies. Um, and in 2020, 2020 uh, July, uh, Melbourne is going through a, a crazy COVID era. Uh, as as the rest of the world, uh, we were pretty much locked down uh, a lot of the times. And my co-founder and I, uh, who uh, is the CTO of Warp right now, Roman, um, we decided to start our own little tech company um, to solve the problem of um, scams and security with um, um, selling secondhand goods. Um, because the only options you had was obviously Facebook Marketplace, Gumtree, etc. So we started Warp um, as a marketplace that um and then we embedded our own tech to it as well um which is which is called that that's where actually the word warp comes from so it's like you know the word warp as in move different places and we added rrp as recommended retail price uh, because what our technology or what we produce was allowed for the market to come up with a price for a second hand good item so that therefore you don't need the buyer and the seller to actually work out and negotiate and and you know, undersell or oversell certain items. So um, we did that, and when we launched after about a year, um, our marketplace just boomed in Australia, and we became the top five Australian marketplace. We won uh, numerous awards from the government um, and the Victorian state, uh, and and various other business industry awards as well. Currently, today it's sitting at you know still the top five Australian marketplace, organically growing. But what happened was with the NFT space, and this is a uh, this is maybe I want to share that part of the story, how, how I got involved with, because obviously from web two site being a standard marketplace, how did I actually end up in NFTs? Um, <clears throat> it's actually quite interesting because all my businesses, as I said, you know, 20 years in the past, I've always built it um, by myself. So I would go to office, um, sit with management. We would do the early, early morning meetings, uh, management meetings on, on uh, six o'clock in the morning on Saturdays. That's typical for all my teams, what I built because Everyone else is sleeping. We get, we get to, you know, do something on a, on a Saturday morning. So I would be away Monday to Saturday. And the only time I get to spend at home is on a Sunday. And I make that about family day and that's it. So I have two kids right now, um, a girl who is nine years old and a boy who is uh, seven. Uh, back then, um, you know, we, on, on a Sunday morning, I would just wake up because I, I'm, I'm just an early, early bird. My wife would be sleeping. She's done a lot, a lot of work during the, the week. And, <clears throat> and we would just, I'll, I'll be with the kids and we would prepare the most easiest thing possible because my wife did not allow me to cook or anything, make a mess in the kitchen or anything like that. 
So we go to the pantry, you know, grab bread, bread cheese, um, and, and tomato sauce, squeezy bottles. And we would make these little toast uh, or bread with cheese on top of it and faces, you know, alien, uh, sad faces and all sorts of faces. And over the years, we've done it over and over uh, all the time. And we built it into this kind of Roblox kind of face because my kids love the game Roblox. So we've made all these faces from Roblox. Uh, but one, one weekend, um, about a year and a half ago, my daughter came up to me on a Sunday and said, Dad, you're in the tech space. Do you, wanna, do you know what NFTs are? And I'm like, Sorry, Dad, you know, your daughter introduced you to NFTs? Absolutely. <laughs> she told me, she said, Dad, you know what NFTs are? And I said, I do not have a clue what NFTs are. I heard about crypto. I heard about that sort of stuff, but I don't know. I'm in the tech space, right? And I should be knowing all this sort of stuff. So uh, I said, my, I, my daughter followed on and said, um, she saw a YouTube clip of um, a 12-year-old boy um, and that sold a pixel whale, uh, a, a, a whale that looks, that formed from a pixel, and he made $250,000 from it, this 12-year-old boy. And I told my daughter immediately, I said, Emily, please uh, stay away from that scams. It's, it's like, you know, dangerous, doesn't look real. <laughs> There's no such thing as getting rich. And, um, and the funny thing was, um, that little moment got me down the rabbit hole of trying to understand what this technology is about. And I, I deep dive straight into it, you know, on that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I was calling meetings with my teams. I was saying, guys, we need to find out what this is. I got all my tech hits together, my best, my best guys. And, I, and we, when we went down this pathway, and we said, damn, this technology is not just about that images, right? It, it is something that is embedded on blockchain. It's decentralized. It's, you know, uh, immutable. It's, it's just so many things to it. And then the following Sunday. Wait, real quick, when was yeah. this approximately? Do you remember when this was? What, yeah, what? This, was, um, this was around, I would say, August last year. August, September August last of year, 2021. You know? Okay. 2021. Going. Yeah. So there's a, and I'll, I'll go through in a second what happened. There's actually major articles and stuff posted on, on this story on the web. Um, but yeah, I came back to my daughter and I said, daughter, um, I'm going to tell you what NFTs are today because I spent a week learning about it and my guys deep dived into it and I even hired some people uh, to actually get involved in this technology in my team straight away on it because I thought this is amazing and we can open up new channels there. So um, my daughter goes, okay, explain to me and I explained to her what NFTs were and she, she and my son immediately got it and she looked at me at this magic moment and she said, Dad, you, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying, what, what do you think? She goes, let's start our own NFT collection from the breads and, and the artwork we're doing right now. I'm like, that is amazing. You know, the only way I know how to, to start businesses is to try it out. Whether we fail or don't fail, doesn't really matter, but you have to try it out to understand the technology and how it works first beforehand. And as the rest, they say, it's history after that because uh, it was the best thing ever. We went onto Twitter. I told my story. I had a hundred followers um, on my own personal Twitter account back then. In about five days, it grew to about thousand followers. I had everyone around the world just asking about this toast and the story, and you know, we gave it the name Toast Punk as well. My kids came up with that as well, um, and uh, and you know, today I'm sitting on about seventy-five thousand followers on my account. Blue verified tick, Twitter involved, big names involved in the space, always talking to. Uh, helped about 130 different projects out there, launched two of our own projects, sold them out, and uh, done many things in the space that I'm proud of, uh, that my team is proud of, that we have helped and provide true utility for actually the, you know, what the space is about and to get on there. And we're building this massive game right now, which I'm so excited about. Okay, so first of all, what a great story and how many people are so excited to hear this. Thank goodness your daughter, who was what, seven or eight years old at the time, right? Was yeah, correct. Your and she says, Dad, I think we should check this thing out. So um, just tell us a little bit about that launch. Like, just give us a little bit of what, what happened when you actually launched the collection. Like, just a little yeah. bit of facts, if you don't mind. Ab absolutely. So the first collection, um, when I went out there, so I've, I've got two collections launched officially by ourselves. And we've got a, we got a third project that we acquired um, just recently in July. Um, but the first collection, when I went out to market and launched it, uh, what happened was I found that the most critical thing you need to do with anything at all is to be open and honest in the web3 space you got to just really tell your story because people really resonate with what you want to do and what you want to achieve with it as long as it's uh, you know of of true value and true nature 
I went up there and I said, I'm, I'm, this is my first project. I don't know what's going on, but this is what my kids and I want to do. And um, I'm, a, I'm a tech entrepreneur um, and I know how to build businesses. Um, and that's all I could tell you know, from, the, from that point onwards. But during, during that very moment onwards all the way through, everything has been a learning curve or, um, for myself. And you know, the cool thing is, as I said, you know, with my kids, I get to come back home not just on a Sunday now, but every other day. Um, and sometimes I work, and, and, you know, during the COVID era, we worked from home as well a lot. Um, I, you know, they would ask me the question when they come, when they come back from school, that how is Toast Fund going? What have you done? I've got some ideas, you know, you should partner up with, you know, a burnt toast on YouTube. You should do this with, you know, Jason Derulo and et cetera. And that's the cool part about it as well. I had a lot of these celebrities in the early stage follow me. Uh, I had Paris Hilton, Jason Derulo, um, uh, uh, that, that, you know, the wrestler guy, anyway, John Cena, my, my son's favorite. Uh, then we have all the real artists like Daniel Weber, who just recently done something with rock followers as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think, I think timing in business is a lot, uh, a lot to do with it as well. I think my timing was great, uh, back then because it was like still early on, people were still trying to find their way. In fact, today they're still trying to find their way around NFTs, but because of my raw story and what I wanted to do and, you know, the simplicity in, in basically my offerings um, and, and then the, the potential possibilities of what I've already delivered now with my tech utility, um, I think people just, you know, um, followed on and, and, and admire that. Okay, so just a couple of quick rapid fire questions. How many um, NFTs were in the first collection that you did? What was the price? And then what about the second collection? Sure. The first collection was a uh, thousand NFTs in total. It was a slow mint. What, the, what I mean by that was it was a stage mint. So, you know, we released 100 at a time, another 150, 200. We only just recently sold out of it maybe five or six months ago out of the total 1000, but it was a high price mint. It was like 0 0.09. So it's about a 0 0.09 ETH, which is about 150 or $200 each. And it scaled okay. up all the way. But today it's sitting at, you know, about three or four ETH uh, in, in the market, which is, you know, people already made, um, well, got the value back in the, in the NFT already. And, you know, a lot of them are holding the NFTs because they know of all the different rewards and perks and all they get with right. my project. Um, but yeah, that's the first project. The second project, which is a uh, uh, very interesting, uh, the second project we did once again, actually stemmed from uh, another story that came out from my kids as well, because after we launched the first project, it did really, really well. We grew our audience up. My kids came up to me on a Sunday again when we were having uh, that breakfast uh, moments and they said, Dad, in fact, actually, we've got, we actually were doing something else before Sunday times. I'm like, what do you mean? They go, we were actually creating these other kind of bread characters before Sunday times. And I'm talking, what do you mean? We were just doing like basic, you know, bread and cheese and, and, and tomato sauce squeezy faces. They go, Dad, you need to, you need to see this. So the next Saturday, they, we got up early. I, I, I took off work. On the kitchen table laid out was like a mess. It was like they had candies, they had rice, they had, you know, veg vegetables, they had salamis, they had all sorts of different things on it. And I thought, what was this smorgasbord of what's going on? And then, um, then, they, uh, then they, they rolled it off like, you know, the napkins and they showed me one by one. They, had, they created toast characters of their favorite you know, Disney characters and Nintendo characters, Pikachu, they had Mickey Mouse, they had they, you know, Shrek, they had, oh, and I'm like, this is amazing. My, my daughter, by the way, she's a, she's a, she's a, like, a, a savant with, with, with art and all of that. So she came up with the whole concept. My, my son just helped along the way. Um, that story is on YouTube as well. But that's how I came up with my second collection. And we, we and, you know, my daughter and I looked at it, each other again, did, had a moment and said, this time, let's go big. Let's go big, like 10,000 instead of 1,000. So we went 10 times more than the next. We made it cheaper because we wanted now to uh, be uh, get more involved with more, more people. And um, we had a very particular kind of market we wanted to hit. And the market I wanted to hit was students. I wanted to make sure that we could get a hold of students in, in particular, you know, new university students or graduates that, you know, were in the tech, uh, was mainly science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, so the STEM, STEM faculties. And, um, and we did, we, we, I used my relationships that I had with all the universities locally here. Somehow or rather, we got a really good connection to 600,000 students across the world. Um, we did a mass email campaign to them, uh, um, a presentation, a DIY competition. And yeah, we, that project went out pretty fast, pretty quick. We sold it out within like you know, a week and a half or something like that. 
um, and it did really, really well. Like today, we still got so many people in our community, all students, all, you know, just wanting to, to be the new phase of what's coming up. So yeah, that's, that's kind of exciting. That's what happened in the second collection. Excellent. Okay. There's, there's um, plenty of entrepreneurs listening to this podcast or aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, what do you want to say to them as far as the benefits of possibly starting an NFT project? Um, I know, obviously, this is not your hus- your full time thing. You're still running your other company, right? But still, what what are the advantages that they might not realize if they don't do a project like this? Maybe talk to the people that are a little skeptical about getting into N- starting an NFT project. Sure. Maybe I'll I'll just correct you there on the full time thing. So my full time my company right now is full time into Web three. So well, oh yeah, no, I meant I meant the Toast Punk isn't your full time thing, right? Oh yeah. So yeah, you are for sure full time into Web three. Correct. Like correct. Clarification. Correct. Yes. So what correct, do you want to say to people who are thinking about starting NFT collections that are? Yeah, sure. So, so there's, you know, in in the Web three space, you know, one one of the types you can one of the types of projects you can launch is an NFT project. Okay, um, but there are various other things in the Web three space as well you can get involved with. You know, from DeFi protocols to uh, games to DAOs to so many other different things. Right. An NFT project though is really um, it's worthwhile because uh, if you do it successfully, if you do it really, really well, then you can amass this massive community behind you, which will then help you do many, many other things in the Web3 space as what I've done. So, uh, you know, my entry into, into the Web3 world is via NFTs, but other people's entry might be a different way. You might go in there and be an investor first, you know, to, to, as in buy, NFT, uh, buy NFTs, collect them, join the communities, understand what's going on. You can also uh, be supportive in terms of getting a job in Web3, maybe uh, learning the ropes as a community manager, as a collab manager, as a moderator, as whatever it is. But um, yeah, my, my main advice and recommendation to anyone, doesn't matter what business it is, always play with your strengths. Always make sure that whatever you're doing, if you're, if you're good at um, you know, creating uh, communities or, or you're good at uh, uh, with people, right? then maybe starting an NFT project is great. If you're a little bit of an introvert, it's fine. Everyone's got different, different sort of ways to do things. If you're an introvert and want to work for someone and know that you've got these skills you can, you can offer, find a job in Web3. Find a big company you can join. Learn, learn the ropes that way. If you've got money and you just want to be an investor, do that same way as well. So there's so many facades. My best recommendation to anyone is essentially follow your strengths. Perfect. Okay, so let's assume people listening are thinking about starting an NFT project. You have done a few yourself. You've been involved with over 100 through your company. What do we need to be thinking about before we start an NFT project? You have essentially learned a lot over the last couple of years since you've been doing this. So what, what are some considerations we need to be thinking before we ever say, okay, we're going full speed ahead and we're going to do an NFT project? Sure. So um, always, always the first plan of attack is always do your research on um on on what you're trying to get involved with as far as you know your nft so it's it's you know i, I would say the worst thing you can ever do is copy someone else and I, i'll say this for one particular reason i know in the real world right now we have a we have a matured market that you know if there's a successful business somewhere you can actually replicate them and change a bit of the nuances to make it your own and make it successful Unfortunately, though, in the Web3 series, because we're really, really, really early, uh, it, everything is changing. The, the narrative is, uh, every day there's a different narrative in the space. I would say, first and foremost, understand your why. Understand wh- what is the purpose of you coming in. Now, if it's to make money in an NFT collection, to mint out and make money, I'll be honest with you, um, 95% of them don't make any money. 5% maybe do due to the, uh, you know, the, the, the hype and the timing and the, and the reality they get later on. But yeah, it, it, is, it, is, it is most importantly crucial to understand what is your why when you want to start an NFT project. And the reason for that, I would say the best reasons for that would be, number one is to first create your community. Create your, your, your base community that you can come into it and, it and they can go with you and they can follow you and do what you need to do in the space. Okay, that's the, that's the most critical thing. That's number one. Um, number two, I would say, um, if you're designing art, uh, if you're an art designer, you don't necessarily need to have a, a you know, a, a project of your own. You can actually join various other projects out there in the Web3 space that offer one-on-one artist opportunities 
to thrive and to do well with, uh, with, with your artwork, okay? So once again, you know, goes back to what is your why, you know, if it's for art, if it's for money, uh, it's for communities to understand. Now, the, the reality is this, um, an NFT project to start is not as easy as it might, you know, seem, even though there's so many YouTube videos out there telling you start an NFT project in 10 minutes and, you know, $100, it's, it's, it's you know, going, those, going down that track is equivalent to you, you know, not even starting a real business at all. It's just like, you know, starting something and, and forgetting about it very, very quickly. So you, you got to understand your capital outlay for it is going to be, um, you know, you're going to be taking into account designers that you, you're going to need. You're going to have developers. Then you're going to have to have auditors to, to audit your contracts to make sure it's all good. Um, then you're going to have, you know, staff members to help you support the project, um, call-up managers. You got to establish discords. You have got to establish social accounts, and many many other things. So, to have that strength or that bandwidth to to have capital to push forward, that's the key thing down there. Um, and yeah, those are the some of the considerations you might have. Um, some of the things we talked about when we were preparing for this interview included um, utility and also technical communications. Let's talk about those things a little bit as well. Absolutely. So I haven't even gone down that part yet. So with utility, absolutely. Um, this is extremely crucial. So, so today, NFT projects out there, most of them, most of them, anyhow, they launch with the plan to, to offer uh, this amazing utility from the, um, the funding that they get from the project. Um, a lot of them do not come to fruition. So I would say before you even start your project, think of that utility, what drive of the utility you have. Now, that word utility can mean many things. Uh, I'm going to give you one example in the terms of a shoe, uh, very simple. So um, a shoe, for example, a shoe that you use, uh, they go to Nike or buy Adidas and buy, your main utility for that shoe is to use it, to walk in it, to jog in it, to, to use it for whatever you want to do. And then the additional utilities to it is like showing off it's an Adidas or it's a special drop or it's a Michael Jordan series or whatever it might be. In the NFT space, a lot of people get confused right now with what actually a utility is. Um, you know, and coming from a tech background, to me, it's always the basis of the tech. What can that tech do for you? It's a, it's, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a data source of you that is, that it can be transferred anywhere you want it to transfer. It's going to live forever. So that's the sort of utility you need to be considerate about, uh, to understand and, and shape up understanding on, on what that is, uh, before you do anything else. Uh, if you do that, you're going to have a great project because, um, people actually rather NFTs today that are dr driven by utility that can use it for something rather than just sit in your wallet and just be a picture. Um, so yeah, yeah that's, let's, that's, let's, that's let's zoom in on that a little bit. What are some sure. examples of utility that either from your toast punks or some of the other projects you've been involved with that might give people a little bit of ideas as far as the possibilities of what can be done here? Yep. So generically, everyone talks about like, this is what I'm hearing in the space a lot about projects. And that's why, uh, um, you know, I'm seeing them. They're not really getting that, that there. Uh, they give a lot of like utility saying that, okay, we're, we're going to offer you free merchandise or we're going to offer you free access tickets to certain events and things like that, right? On, on the other hand, what we did was, for example, uh, in Toastpunk, we created, um, um, being a tech company, we created an automated trading bot uh, called Crypto Toast, which is, in essence, um, each NFT that you own can be used um, to connect to your Binance wallet or your crypto wallet to give you automatic trades, um, which, which, which returns between 0.5 to about 2% per day. Um, and you can either compound that or don't compound that. So that's one form of real tangible utility you can actually use with your toes. Um, the other thing we have done as well is we've created um, a game and we were initially created the game for, um, for our community, but instead we decided to create a massive game uh, for everyone else where you can use that NFT as a character in the game um, and, and not just you know, to play with it, but actually to actually race and earn with it. Because in the, in the blockchain space, you've got uh, this race and earn capabilities within uh, um, uh, blockchain. So that's what we've done as well. But yeah, those are some of the, the, the things that uh, as far as utility you can get. Um, and you've got obviously projects out there that, you know, bigger, bigger mainstream projects that are attempting, attempting other sort of utilities. Like, you know, you've got, um, you know, Starbucks and, and, um, and um, Reddit, which recently done a massive, massive drop. And we can go through that in a second if you want to, Michael. Oh, uh, you can go to it now. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, Reddit did a massive uh, drop. And this is not so much about utility, but I would say more so about adoption, which is, which is, which is critical. 
which forms part of the long-term utility vision of Reddit. So Reddit did a massive job just recently. Now, by the time this is out, probably it's going to be, you know, a month, a month and a half away. But Reddit did this amazing thing where they onboarded 50 million wallets. It was ridiculous. Like it was the biggest ever move that anyone have done as far as mainstream moving across to Web3. So applaud to them there. And the cool thing they did was they did not even use the word NFTs. They used the word digital collectible. Um, and it became the utility for their avatars in Reddit. Now, Reddit being a social platform that is always dependent on their karma points and their profile pics, um, that was, in fact, the best utility ever given to them. Okay, so kudos to them on how they did it. Then you've got just a month and a half before that uh, as well, Starbucks came on with their own um, um, NFT onboarding of massive millions of people in, in, from mainstream to, uh, to NFTs. And another cool thing they did was they did not even call it NFTs as well. It was a loyalty card system that they, they came up with for, that came with their coffee cups that when you bought it. Uh, once again, that is amazing utility driven via mainstream for a loyalty, loyalty rewards kind of program. Okay? Now, not everyone can pull that off. You need to be a big company in Web2 um, in order for you to do that. So I'm just looking forward to that. So many other opportunities out there, I guess, with Web2 uh, companies. You know, there's Google, there's Amazon, there's cloud services, there's telephony. There's so many things that could actually come across um, as long as, you know, they, they tick all the boxes and their stakeholders are all prepared to, to make the move. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's some crazy sort of stuff going to come up soon. Well, I love the fact that the utility that you designed for Toast Punk is very advanced, obviously, right? Like most of the utility that I think about, like, for example, Moonbirds is a project I'm a big part of. And um, what they do is if you, quote unquote, put your Moonbird into a nest, right, then you can earn merchandise, you can earn free stuff, NFT projects, all that kind of stuff, which is a traditional form of utility. Gary Vaynerchuk, obviously, with his V friends gives you access to his VCon for three years, which is a great example of utility. Another example is the, the Bulls and Apes project, um, which I've had these guys on my show. They, they have um, a tokenomics where you earn what they call meth token every day that you hold your bull. And what happens is you can trade these tokens in for NFTs. So you can actually generate free NFTs and they figured out a way to make them all work together. And then you can you can you can generate these NFTs and these NFTs and then burn them and then get the God NFTs, right? And they're all things you can sell on the secondary market, but these are all kind of advanced utility. But I do feel like this is becoming more of an expectation for bigger Correct. projects to be successful, right? Because just saying you're going to develop a metaverse thing, everybody knows that's not going to happen, right? Yeah, or just absolutely. claiming you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do something isn't really as effective yeah. anymore. Now that brings up a, my logical next question is, which is like, whoa, this is out of the reach of most people to be able to develop this kind of stuff. So what's the tech side of things? Like, how do we need to be thinking about this? Like, cause this sounds like this can get kind of pricey, right? It is super pricey. So you would see the projects that are actually doing really, really well, such as Moonbirds, uh, such as the others out there that you mentioned. They have massive capital funding uh, before even the project starts. So Moonbirds obviously being um, you know, part of the Proof Collective, yep. they've got $50 million invested in by A16Z, uh, which is the one of the biggest investors in Web3 space. Um, some of the other projects out there, Doodles also got backed up. Obviously, Yuga Labs right now got backed up by Animoca and their team. Um, it, it, it is, capital is required. You cannot expect to um, do this by yourself or, or get an amazing project by yourself. doesn't matter who you are or what you are. This space always requires capital because, because you need to build that tech. You need to actually establish that tech, right? So that, that utilities you mentioned before, like the staking for the tokens and for the, you know, for the mint to mutate, and that, that's actually very, very cheap. I'll be honest with you. I know from the tech side, it's so easy. I, I, I give it as freebies to my, to my holders. I don't care. Like, you know, I, I would just wake up today on Twitter. I would say, you, 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 you get merchandise. I don't care. It's for free, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. To, it, to me, that's not real utility yet. Real utility, as I said, it's, it's when you actually take that NFT, the underlying tech of it, convert it or integrate it with something, make it real life that people actually use it for, like your shoes, like you actually use it for on a daily basis on something. If you don't, if it's just there for, you know, like a carrot, okay, I, I, I think that is not real utility. That's just 
carrot dangling. Okay. So um, project expectations today of, of the community expectation out there today because the market is so small, they, they, they expect all those things you spoke, spoke of before. And, and they're not stupid as well. Today, they know really, you know, when you go out there and claim that you're going to build a metaverse, they're going to say, they're not only going to not support your project. They're going to call you, call you out. You're going to get farted on. So, you know, be, be wary with what you want to do. Know your scope. Uh, you know, that, that's what I said before. Understand your why. Understand your bandwidth. Understand what you're capable of. Now, because I am, you know, I built technology products. I've built all the way from small, all the way to build, all the way from small businesses to big businesses to exits as well. Um, funding as well. You know, we've been raising all the way from small all the way to big. So to me, that's not, not like, you know, when, when I go out there, I can confidently say, I'm going to do this. And I do it. You know, simple as that. Um, and yeah, I start small, grow bigger, um, give certain things out. But yeah, I, my, my eye is always on the prize when it comes to uh, projects, especially that, that are well capitalized, uh, good, good roadmaps. Uh, the founders are there to understand what's going on and obviously having their own traction as well. Let's talk a little bit about the smart contract because you can't easily change it, right? And this is something that a lot of people need to think about, right? So talk to me about like, educate our audience a little bit about why this is so important to get right out of the gate. Absolutely, man. So for those of you that don't know what a smart contract is, it is essentially your piece of software um, that, that interacts with the blockchain, um, whatever blockchain you're going on, whether it's Ethereum or, you know, Stacks or Layer 2 or whatever. But it is the embedded software that that recognizes the uh, what what happens with your project, stores the data. Where is the data stored? Uh, is it on the chain? Is it on IPFS? Um, you know how does your minting process work? How does your supply work and everything else? It's all embedded there. Now, the di the key difference for for the guys that are that built software before in Web two and uh, to understand this is the Web two side of things when you build software. You can actually up, update it or upgrade it anytime you want. And you can change your database rules. You can, you can do whatever you want. In the Web3 space, in your smart contract, that's why they, I think that's why they probably gave it the name contract because it's binding, right? <laughs> um, you can't actually change it. You actually, your, your main core forms and rules and agreements and, and you know, your, your, your execution framework, everything has to be embedded on there. Now, I, I tell them just to help people understand this, this is kind of like launching a website and never being able to update it, right? That's correct. As <laughs> simple as that. Can you, imagine, simple. can you imagine if you launched a website and you've been in business for 10 years and you were not allowed to edit it once, not allowed to change it once? You better get it right, right? That, that's how important it is. Um, but as I was saying, you know, I, I, I had a team yesterday. I was talking to two uh, various other teams, like uh, about, about 40 other people down there just you know, having our regular monthly sort of chat. And, um, and I was going through, you know, how do we go from here to here in terms of, you know, you know we're already here with Web 2, we're already here with Web 3. How do we go to here, you know, in terms of understanding your capabilities in tech? So there's all these little things within contracts that you need to understand where there's a massive balancing act, okay? One key aspect of uh, 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 the blockchain is that you know, you're going to be paying these fees, okay? These transaction fees called gas fees to the blockchain, to the miners to help you process all these transactions that you're doing on there, right? Every single interaction with the contract has a gas fee, okay? And this is like, you know, it's fine because in, in Web2, you're going to play, you're going to pay hosting anyway. You're going to pay your, you know, your server securities, all that sort of stuff. That's fine anyway, but it's fixed, right? This one here is dependent on your load. Now, it depends on two things. One is your load and one is your rules within your contract. If you, if you say, okay, you got this really smart idea to build something and you don't test out your contract and your gas goes really high, then you're not going to have an issue with you know, usability. You're going to have an issue with users trying to actually get on because they're going to say, it's a waste of my money. I'm, I'm spending too much gas. You know? and, and then you're going to have that other issue, the UX issue. So it's a balancing act that you've got to always do when you create con smart contracts. The solutions out there right now that help, like layer two embedded protocols and all sorts of things, but yeah, this is super important for you before you even start thinking that you need to consider these things. It's not, it's not as easy. And then there is available because, if, you know, you, you're going to say it's open source. Everything's out there. I can just go out there and grab a, a, a contract from, you know, GitHub and, and, and use it for my project. You can go ahead and try to do it if it's a simple project. But once again, you know, you're copying the same thing out there and it's not going to be 
anything unique for the space that that you're going to actually get a real impact out there. So well, you need to create your own. <laughs> and this is <laughs> the example, you know, with Moonbirds, I got in on day one and um, they thought the way that they had developed their contract was that if you were, if your Moonbird was nested, right, then you couldn't sell it on the secondary markets. Well, it turned out that that, was, that wasn't true. You can. It's a vulnerability. Yeah. There. Absolutely. It was vulnerability, Absolutely. right? And despite the fact that they went out and they had everything audited, it was, there was still a problem with it, right? So. And, and there's no real easy fix other than just acknowledging that it still can be sold this way, right? So we, we solve that problem. We solve that problem in you our race. Solve that problem? Oh. Uh, so, you know, you know, you know, so we have the same situation as well. We, you know, we, we got this racer club game coming up where um, each club is created and formed for that NFT community. So this is where, you know, the utility gap is going to, you know, we're going to try to solve where a lot of projects out there, they can't build a metaverse. They can't build a game. It's too expensive. That's fine. You just get a racer club license and we would start a game for you, right? Using our framework. Now, one of the key things there was uh, we wanted to make sure that when you mint a game pack license, uh, one of the 2,500 game pack licenses, that it gets auto staked on the contract, right? And one of the things came up where we go, okay, we don't want to make, we want to make sure that it also doesn't get sold anywhere else. You can sell within our platform, our own marketplace, but not on a third party, right? So yeah, I, I won't divulge what we did to solve that problem, but we, we managed to solve that problem in a gas efficient format. So yeah, we got no problems to make sure that, you know, the, the holders, there won't be any reason for them to, to unstake anyway, because, you know, I know Moonbirds has access to um, certain things that they provide, but we have uh, something called a charge because it's a game, right? It's like, you know, we got to make it like a, like a cool interactive sort of metaverse. So every day you get a 1% charge. It's like your phone, right? When you charge your phone. Okay, there you um, go. You know, yeah, so every day you get a 1% charge. It's not tokens, it's not nothing. It's just an appearance thing. But there's a purpose of that uh, down the track because we want to give ourselves 100 days from the time we do the min to make sure we onboard 800 clubs, which is a massive amount of clubs. And it's like a mission. It's like, you know, if you've seen that, um, that, that, that Top Gun Maverick, um, you know, the two Mission Impossible app instances, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. one of them that we added to my... In fact, that's our... Project code word uh, internally in our team. It's called Mac Ten. Uh, we want to make sure that you know in hundred days we onboard eight hundred clubs. So that counter, that one percent charge counter, gives the users and gives us uh, a form of understanding. Like we've got a countdown here to go get to our one hundred percent of eight hundred clubs, and then we can do the rest on as I create all sorts of things. But yeah, we solve back to. I'm just gonna say sorry to deviate, but back I was gonna say about that Moonbirds thing. Um, definitely, we 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 solve. We managed to solve that. Well, I know that I've freaked out. We've probably freaked out a ton of people here about like, first of all, this utility is completely out of reach of a lot of people who are listening and obviously, but the contract part of it doesn't have to be out of reach, right? You can hire people. to uh, You can, definitely. Right? And you can hire. That's what we do. That's what we do. We, 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 we look at projects. We first, they come up to us with an idea. We say whether or not your idea is worthwhile or not worthwhile, even spending our time on. If it's semi-worthwhile and we know that, you know, there's some work to be done. We then sit down with them and work out a whole plan on, on you know, understanding it from a contract point of view, from your uh, user interface point of view, from your deliverables point of view, you know, and what's it going to cost? And, you know, we hit them with that number. Um, and, you know, that number is not like we, we don't make, like we don't make it stupid money or anything like that. We just make it normal. Um, but, you know, then they'll realize that, okay, I need to spend, you know, 100 grand, 200 grand, you know, 50 grand, 80 grand, whatever. Um, and that's only the development side. Then you've got marketing. You got ongoing, you got everything else. It's just people got to understand these things, you know. That's the most critical. Yeah, I want to talk about communication too with the uh, the uh, people that are thinking about buying the project. So we're, we're we're again talking to people who are getting ready to start a project. What yep. kind of advice would you give on the communication side of things? Okay, to, to um, prospective investors, if you will, that want to buy the NFTs. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So I would say, you know, it's it's quite important for you to actually. Um, uh, uh, let yourself known as to who you are and what you are trying to do. Don't try to be anom at the back and anonymous and you know mysterious and all that sort of storytelling stuff. I mean, it works sometimes. Like you know, just recently, Art Gobblers. Um, like it was only yesterday. Um, in Minter, so it's a new thing altogether. But mm. Art Gobblers, uh, they 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 weren't really anonymous. We know who they were. Um, but yeah, they went crazy mint out. Uh, as I said, you just all you got to do is be honest with your market, you know, understand where you're going to go and where you're going to head. And, and that's the most, I would say, the most important thing for you to, to establish at the start. 
with your with your investors as well. Um, they're going to ask you so many questions around your roadmap, your white paper, poten potentially uh, who's actually doing your work for you, where's your contracts being audited. The, the more sophisticated ones now will understand all those things there. The ones that come up with the behaviors of when whitelist, how do I get whitelist and all of that, you're going to know for a fact that those investors are going to come in and they're going to flip out of your project straight away because they will just want to get in quick and get out quick as well. So um, yeah, carefully choose who you work with as well. Um, you know, and I know you can't, it's not easy because there's thousands of people out there, but there's certain rules you can apply within your community. You can say, you know, the, the purpose of us is doing this or, you know, your whitelisting methods. How do you do them? Do you, are you going to open it up to anyone out there for bots to attack or are you going to make it very exclusive? As I said, you know, the, back to the Art Gobblers project yesterday, they made it actually hyper-exclusive, too exclusive to the point where it was only accessible by the, the rich, as in the mega influencers. I did a post on it LinkedIn yesterday. Their, their price shot up to, I don't know, have you heard of that, Michael? No, Art no, no. no, no so I... They did better than Moonbirds uh, uh, launch. Really? So, yeah. Um, their, their price is sitting at 17.99 ETH right now. Wow. Um, did a volume of close to 8,000 ETH in, in about uh, less than 24 hours. Um, and yeah, they just, they went, they went berserk, um, but they made it hyper exclusive to only influencers. As in, even I couldn't get in, in, in one of those. I actually, if I knew I would have just reached out and I could have got one, but I didn't reach out, didn't, didn't have enough time. But yeah, all the, all the mega influencers from, you know, Farouk to Gary V to all the big ones, they're the only ones who got whitelist. And, um, there's a good, the bad and the ugly side to that there. Obviously, you know, the, these influencers are, Going to be dumping their bags on their own followers right now, which is not good. Um, but yeah, it, it creates, it shows that, you know, this space, there's potential for anything to happen and anything to happen at any one time. That's why it's so important to follow the narrative. Fascinating. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you've got this thing called Racer Club coming out. Maybe you can yes. just explain a little bit more about what that is, just in case people want to check it out. Yeah, sure, sure. It's uh, my, this is um, one of the things that, that, you know, my team and I, and my community as well truly believe that will change the way how uh, Web3 games are looked at today. Um, so, um, you know, as I said early on, this was a, this was a game started out uh, like a simple game just for our community. You know, jump on, everyone race, everyone have a bit of fun and, uh, and you know, earn some money, uh, earn some tokens. It, we built the initial thing uh, at the very beginning in, the, in Unity um, and it was okay. It was not bad, but, you know, we had, uh, to me, it was always, let's, how do I affect this? Like, I went back to my why when I started. How do I affect this space to leave a legacy on? So we then upgraded it totally to, to all Unreal Engine. So we did a partnership with Epic Games. Um, I got on a team of people that work with Marvel, um, uh, Nintendo, and various other high-end sort of uh, uh, game studios. Got a, I got the, put, put together the team, and we decided to create this massive game called Racer Club, which was not only for us, but for, as I said, um, 2,500 NFT projects out there to give them utility, instant utility, not just to start a game, but to actually use the existing NFTs in a game. And that was the challenge. The biggest challenge was how do you integrate these existing NFTs into the game? And, and, and okay, well, I got to ask, how did you decide which 250? Did you go for the bigger collections or like are Moonbirds part of this or what kind? What yeah, kind? Moon, Moonbirds, Moonbirds is on the allow list. Um, so... How we, how we did it was um, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a platform called nftx.io, which is a vaulted platform. Um, some of you might know it. The Moonbird's on there as well. Uh, CryptoPunks is on there. MAYC is on there. It's a vaulted platform for NFT collections where anyone, not just the founder, uh, um, uh, say, for example, if I'm a big holder of this particular project, I can put in like, you know, 20 NF to start the vault. I can put in 20 NFTs or 30 NFTs in there, pair it with ETH, Therefore, give it a token price. It's a one-on-one -on -one kind of liquidity measure, okay? And by doing that, not only your NFT now comes in the form also as a token, but, you know, it protects your floor on OpenSea because all your uh, not-so-rare NFTs are not going to be chucked on the floor on OpenSea. They're going to be actually sold to the vault or staked in the vault uh, to earn APY. On top of that as well, um, you can actually have a market maker come in via SushiSwap and put in E to that vault and increase the price of the token. And when the token price increases, the NFT price increases as well simultaneously because you've got to arbitrage between the price of the floor on OpenSea and the token price. So it's a very smart concept that NFTX came up with. That's why all the big projects are on there and that's what they use mainly to, to sort of control their floor on OpenSea. So we decided, we said, hey, 
they they're doing something like that. Like, great, let's let's you know, have a partnership with them there. And we did that. We said we're not going to come up with our own game token. We're going to use these tokens that are already in the vault, and we're going to just embed them in each and every racer club game. So, for example, you know, Moonbirds, uh, Moonbirds when they start their own Moonbirds racer club, you know, we will use that Moonbirds token that is already available there in that club, so that every money spent goes back into the vault of Moonbirds and increases mm-hmm. that token as well. So it's like kind of a, a way how we encourage existing utility and existing tokens NFT as well. The cool thing about NFTs is this though, what we managed to do was we went down the, uh, again, you know, we went down uh, CC0, which is um, uh, 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 public license use of NFTs. There's two types. a 16 came up with this here, what, one, one that fits under the bracket of non-CC0, which is non-public use and CC0. This is another thing for project owners to consider as well. You can embed in a smart contract to identify what, uh, what your holders would actually use these NFTs for. Anyhow, we went out with the IP rights and all of that there. We managed to work out with our lawyers that uh, for each racer club, all it needs is 10 people to actually imprint their NFTs or give them and say, hey, he, I assign my IP of my NFT to you, um, to racer club, to start the racer club. And then we can create those 10 hero characters for each club to be used by all the other holders. So, you know, if you walk in, it's like going to a Mario game. You know, you got Mario, Luigi, Donkey, Princess, Toad, etc. It's the same as well in Racer Club. In, so, for example, Moonbirds Racer Club, you might have the Kevin Rose uh, as the hero there. You might have the, you know, the other various ones, the one-on-one. You can choose them and use them uh, in the game and you can play to earn. Very fascinating. Um, this is so interesting. Um, first question, well, just a couple of cap questions here. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you, Matt, for sharing all this insight. I know some people's heads are pretty much exploding at this juncture. Sorry. <laughs> I always do that, everyone. Oh, but that's, that's in mind. <laughs> if, okay, number one, if they want to reach out to you on socials, what's the best way to get to you on which platform? And then number two, if they want to reach to your company, where do they go? And then number three, if they want to find out more about Racer Club, where do they go for that as well? So first, oh, Absolutely, man. So first, the, the best, business, yeah. the, the most active place I am is on Twitter uh, under the, um, you can see uh, uh, toastpunk.eth. Um, that's, that's my official Twitter account. It's got a blue tick. You can see that there. Uh, if you need anything at all, you can just DM me on Twitter. My, my DMs are always open. That's one of the key things I make sure. And I'm the one that's answering, not, not anyone else. Uh, if you get an answer from someone else, uh, it's going to be very suspicious. <laughs> but you get an answer from me. I, I always go through my DMs. Uh, I like to do that. Um, alternatively, you can always you know, uh, jump onto um, uh, the Racer Club game website, uh, racerclub.game. And you know, from there, there'll be contact information for you to, 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 to work out whatever you want to you know, do with us, whether it's you know, come and join us uh, as an employee a staff member, a partner, investor, um, et cetera. That's all there. There's also links to our white paper, which is quite important. I just updated it recently as well. So you can check out the whole um, detailed information on what our project Racer Club is about. But yeah, um, if, you, if you go to my Twitter, you will see links to uh, a Linktree bio that will, will send you through various things such as my Discord, um, um, the merchandise store uh, for Toastpunk, if you really want to buy something, but that's... <laughs> To, to me, don't worry. Just wait for me to give it to you. I give it to everyone all the time. Um, and uh, there'll, be, there'll be places to go to for our NFTX vault as well. So we've got a vault for our token. You can invest in there if you want to as well. Uh, but yeah, a lot of stuff will be on my Twitter account. And also, obviously, you can, you can professionally connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to. Just look, look up Matthew Ng. Um, and I have that toastpunk.e thing as my middle name as well. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um, by all means, man, just reach out. I have to. Yeah, and for those that are listening to the podcast, his last name is spelled NG. And then also um, on Twitter, it's actually twitter.com slash toastpunk, um, not toastpunk.eth. That's your name on Twitter. So just correct, correct. That in. I just wanted to clarify that. Yep, yep. No, sorry. Yeah, that's the. No, it will be. Good. You have a. I'm the only one with the blue tick there. I made sure of that. Twitter yep. and I are very, very good friends. Um, <laughs> so you know that it's the, it's the verified uh, uh, project. Matthew, thank you so much for uh, sharing all your insights and thoughts with us. We're way better because of it. Thank you so much. Michael, it's a pleasure to be here and glad, man. Anytime I'll be, be, be happy to come back.